Most of the time, my D&D combats end up as a boring slog where the players and monsters stand still and hit each other until one of them dies. But I'm determined to change that. So I'm going to share the five tips I'm going to use to turn my combats from this to this. and how you can make yourself some cards like these to help with tip number three. Thank you so much to Homie and the Dude for sponsoring this video. I'm excited to tell you about their new Studio Ghibli inspired setting later in the video. Welcome to the table. I'm Kelly, and if you use at least two of these in every combat, you're gonna like the way you combat. I guarantee it. If you think about your favorite combats from the actual play shows that you watch or listen to, I'm willing to bet that they all had this going on. And when I implemented it, it had the most significant impact of all the tips here. Oh, weird. Something's going on with the top. Title. Hang on. Most combat encounters are going to have the objective of defeating the enemy. This could be through diplomacy or by killing them. But you can make your combat encounters way more interesting and dynamic by giving your players a second objective. Ah, there we go. Fixed it. You see pro DMs do this all the time, but what makes a good second objective? One of my all time favorite examples is the ship battle in Dimension 20's A Crown of Candy. That whole series is a masterclass in dynamic combat, by the way. It's worth a month of the subscription just to watch that series. The party is sailing with an ally to another kingdom when they're attacked. They discover that the attack is an assassination attempt on their ally, so they now need to defend themselves and protect their ally. Brennan also brings in tip number three here to really take this combat to the next level, but I'll come back to that. Protecting an ally is a great second objective, but some other ones that I've used are preventing the completion of a spell, destroying an object before it can be used, preventing an enemy from escaping, solving a puzzle to escape endless waves of enemies, or saving innocent creatures. In a recent session, my party had to kill a rival pirate captain who had betrayed the pirate code by robbing a gambling den that was considered neutral territory. When my party found the pirate crew, they were in the midst of casting a modified teleportation circle to escape. These wizards could use an act Action to progress the spell track. If the spell track got to 10, then the teleportation circle would open and the pirate crew could escape with the gold. Having these other objectives made a huge difference, and it turned what could have been a boring hack and slash into a much more interesting encounter, at least for the first couple of rounds. But it did become a bit stagnant in the later rounds, and I wish I had used this next tip. Tip number two is really useful for two reasons. It can be used to keep combat interesting in later rounds, and it's also a great tool for balancing encounters. <sighs> I am so sorry, I don't know what is going on with these titles. If you started a combat and after the first round realized that it's way too easy, or worse, way too deadly, introducing new monsters in the second or third round of combat can keep the encounter feeling fresh and interesting. And it can help you balance it because you can decide how many monsters to introduce right in the moment. There are a number of in-game reasons you can use for introducing new monsters. The most obvious one being they were just nearby and heard the commotion. But you can also have one of your monsters summon other creatures, or you can build into the environment some sort of portal or doorway that's only opened on a later round. You could have terrain release monsters, like ice melting each round releasing frozen sleeping monsters. Or for higher level fights, monsters that evolve or change as their HP is reduced. One of my favorite examples of this is in the final boss fight of campaign one of Not Another D&D Podcast. The final big bad, the Ala, takes on different forms throughout the fight. Each form has a different stat block and they must all be defeated in order to defeat her permanently. The angry GM wrote an article on creating these types of monsters, and I've linked it down below. Balancing an encounter where you introduce other monsters later in the combat can be tricky. Besides deciding in the moment how many monsters to introduce, you can also use this free tool that makes it way easier. I've mentioned it before, but Trekiros, who has an excellent YouTube channel, made a free encounter simulator tool. In that tool, you can specify that certain monsters are introduced in subsequent rounds, and you can see the effects it has on your party's and your monster's health throughout the combat. It's awesome. I use it all the time. Now before I show you how you can use these to really take your combat to the next level, I want to tell you about this new Studio Ghibli inspired setting guide from the sponsor of today's video, Homie and the Dude. The Wandering Tavern is a massive floating city that can be the setting for your next campaign or plugged into an existing campaign for a shorter arc. This setting guide is packed with 15 huge battle maps, over 30 NPCs, 30 plot hooks, and a bunch of other cool stuff like magic items, airships, downtime games, and other mechanics. Tensions are running high as several different factions vie for power in this sprawling city. The factions are all distinct, each with their own characters and goals. The automatons are planning a revolt. The 
Claw Mafia is running their black market trade and the captain is just trying to keep everything running smoothly. I think this could make for a great setting to run a first campaign in because it's big enough that there's lots going on, but it's also contained, which means you could prep as much as you like. The Kickstarter is on until May 9th and they're planning to deliver the book in June so you won't have to wait long. Check it out at the link below. In all my favorite battle sequences from movies, TV shows, and actual play shows, the battlefield changes throughout, which forces everyone to change their tactics and strategies, keeping the battle interesting. In the Battle of Helm's Deep in The Lord of the Rings Two Towers, this occurs when Saruman's army breaches the impenetrable outer wall, causing a massive retreat and a change of tactics. In the ship battle from A Crown of Candy, one of the ships is sinking throughout the encounter, meaning the terrain is always changing, forcing people to move. Tip number three is to change the terrain of the battlefield throughout the encounter. Because you aren't always fighting on sinking ships or fighting in large scale battles where walls and buildings can get blown up, I've come up with a deck of cards that you can use in almost any encounter. There are different cards for different environments. You can use them either in prep or right at the table during the encounter. You can draw a card and then mark the effects on the battlefield. These can be used with pretty much any system or genre, so they contain inspiration for changes that could occur rather than listing out actual mechanics with saves and DCs. You could also potentially use these as roll tables, but I've got enough to roll during combat already and there's something fun about drawing a card in front of your players and showing the result. The cards are available right now at the $5 tier on Patreon, which is linked down below. I also have a video on the Patreon walking through how to make a custom generator in Obsidian using a free plugin, so you could easily make yourself a custom terrain change generator using that process. If you're making your own terrain change roll table or card deck, the way I went about it was to create a list of generic effects that terrain could have on the battlefield, then I flavored them for each environment. These are the generic effects I came up with, which I used as the basis for all my terrain change effects. Not doing this next tip is something I'm constantly guilty of, and when I do it, it really makes a huge difference. Luckily, if you give your monsters a second objective, or if you change the terrain throughout the combat, it's likely that you'll automatically be doing this move your monsters. Often I move my melee monsters into position and then they just stay there. They just stand in front of the melee players and trade blows back and forth and it gets very boring. I think this is so important that I put a bright sticky note on my monitor so it's staring me right in the face. Now you don't want all your monsters to be taking opportunity attacks every round, so you can either pick monsters that have some sort of disengage or teleport feature like the blink dog, or you can give your monsters a bonus action disengage like the goblin's nimble escape feature. It makes much more sense if your monsters have a reason to move, like they're trying to accomplish something or chasing someone, but even if they don't, just having them move to attack a different character each round can make a big difference. Make them chase the squishy ranged characters around, or have them gang up on one character and then move to another. Going forward, I'm going to move at least half of my monsters every single round. This next tip goes hand in hand with moving your monsters, and it'll give you another reason to move some of your monsters around. There's also actually a bonus tip at the end of this video, but... I'm getting ahead of myself. Having an array of different monsters in each combat can give you more options for tactics. I like to have at least one magic creature in every combat, but if that doesn't make sense, then I'll at least have some melee creatures, some ranged creatures, and some high mobility creatures. Having some ranged monsters gives you the option to focus fire or target players to break concentration without having to chase a player around. It'll also give you a reason to move your monster if the melee players are coming after your ranged creatures. And then having some monsters with magic or AoE can prevent your players from grouping together out of fear, which will keep things spread out. The extra bonus tip is to try out a different initiative system to really keep things dynamic. The initiative system from the upcoming MCDM RPG allows players to choose who goes next, and it can change with every round. This allows your players to strategize and change up the turn order round to round, which keeps things fresh and dynamic. You can check out this video here for my experience using it in my 5e game, and also get a bonus tour through the history of initiative in D&D. I found it super cool. I appreciate you.